Hi everybody, welcome to this EGG webinar. My name is Mary O'Keefe. I'm a physiotherapist and research projects advisor at EFIC. This morning, I'm delighted to be joined by Elena Makovac, who is a recipient of an EGG. And Elena is a postdoctoral research associate at King's College London. And this morning, she's going to be talking about her EGG experience and her research. So Elena, thanks so much for joining us. Do you wanna start off by telling us why did you apply for an EGG? Hi, hi, Mary. Thanks, thanks for inviting me, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, so I, I applied for the EGG because um, I was in that career stage where I was kind of ready to start thinking about gathering research fundings. But um, I think, as as it happens for for many of my colleagues, I was maybe a bit shy to step into the big uh, into the big uh, grants. And um, the EGG grant was ideal for for my needs at that moment. So it was an intermediate small grant, uh, which would act as a springboard, which would allow me to, to gather some data, to demonstrate that I'm able to produce good research questions and gather some fundings. Um, but there was another factor that actually had a role in my case. Uh, well, first of all, I was new to pain research, but I had already a, a solid CV. So it was brought to my attention as one of the prestigious smaller grants uh, in the pain, pain field, um, which would allow me to establish myself a little bit more. Uh, but uh, another thing that had um, that played a crucial role was the fact that it was I was able to tailor it to my uh, needs. Um, what I mean here is that uh, I was in a situation which I think it's common to many other uh, early career researchers that I was employed on another bigger grant, so I was a postdoc on another grant, so I needed to dedicate my time to the needs of the big grant. Uh, but EEG actually allowed me to, uh, in my case, employ a research assistant, which was I, I wouldn't be able to, to do the project otherwise. And uh, there are other smaller grants out there which do not allow for something like this. So that was a crucial factor in my in my uh, in my specific case, for example. And what would you say were your personal impressions of the EGG in general? So um, I had a very positive experience from the start. Um, and uh, I'm smiling because uh, one of the points that I always mention, and I don't, I don't know if it's trivial or just maybe not so important, but it was for me at that moment, is that the whole application was very, very applicant friendly, very straightforward. And uh, when you're in that stage where you actually apply for different schemes and you, you just have to adapt words and lands and characters and space and no space, that actually can be very tiring and take a lot of mental space. And that wasn't the case of with EGG. And I remember just feeling, oh, thank God. Uh, but apart from that, um, that positive start, after the announcement of winners, uh, I think I had from the beginning a sense of uh, everyone wanting to kind of give space to early career researchers, wanting to hear our ideas and wanting to build a community. Uh, so, for example, we were invited to join after the, the announcement of winners. We were all invited, all the winners, recipients of the of the grant, were invite, invited for the EFIC conference in that year in Valencia, and uh, we had dinners organized. We were able to, uh, you know, meet each other to build relationship collaborations to meet the senior uh, people from uh, EFIC and Grenadal. And there was an overall sense of people wanting to give space to the to the early career researchers, to wanting to hear um, our ideas, um, to want, wanting to invest in the new generations, and, and that was really motivating. Um, and in my specific case, what I also appreciated a lot is that um, I was actually coming from a, more of an effective neuroscience background, and I was uh, a little bit new to pain research, obviously the overlap is what we know it is, it's substantial and uh, um, and uh, I was bringing original ideas, uh, but I just wasn't penalized for being an outsider, so to say, of not having a strong pain only research background, um, but everything that mattered was actually my idea, my, uh, my, um, my expertise meeting the pain research and creating a, a novel idea, and that was um, that was really, uh, really motivating, yeah. Great, so if we move on to your exact research, could you provide us with a, an overview of the project that was funded? 
Yeah. Um, so the general aim of my project and a little bit of my research activity is to investigate uh, brain body interactions. So MRI research, um, neural networks, and physiology. In this specific case, I wanted to investigate the uh, brain body interaction in chronic low back pain. Um, uh, the chronic low back pain was, um, so to say, an important topic. Obviously, it, it's it's a very important topic to be researched. But um, I think in my case was a model of chronic pain, and what I'm hoping is to unveil some mechanisms that that can that can actually be expanded to um, all the other chronic pain um, conditions. Um, I bring together in my project two mechanisms that are kind of described in the literature. Uh, definitely, there was uh, a good uh, a good science behind um, the research of um, of an impairment of the sending pain modul uh, modulating mechanisms in chronic pain. Uh, but on the other side, uh, we also know that there is a dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, especially lowering of heart rate variability and an imbalance in the sympathetic parasympathetic um, uh, functioning. So I bring together these two mechanisms and I start from some pilot data that I gathered before applying to this grant um, in which I see in healthy young uh, participants that um, the way uh, our heart rate variability is expressed during pain uh, is associated with the way we engage in the sending pain modulating pathway. So basically these two, uh, um, these two mechanisms are part of, of one. Um, so in my project that I presented to um, EGG was uh, first of all to expand this uh, mechanism and investigating in chronic pain. Um, and second, uh, I'm using, uh, I'm actually actively perturbing the autonomic nervous system. So I'm using a device which stimulates the baroreceptors and induces a slight alteration of the parasympathetic tone. So I'm not just only looking at the association, but I'm actually inducing perturbation to see how one factor influences the other. So tackling a little bit into causality as well. Um, yeah, so this is more or less what, what I'm doing. I, I would like to see if the manipulation of the autonomic nervous system can influence the sending pain modulating pathways and whether this association is disrupted in chronic low back pain. Great. And the EGG we know focuses on very innovative projects that are have a high probability of influencing patient care. So in your view, what's the most innovative aspect of your project and how might you see it impacting patients in the future when it's done? Okay. Um, I think it's innovative in many aspects. So I do believe I'm, I tackle into a relatively unexplored area still. So we all know that obviously pain has an autonomic effect. Uh, but what I find that it's a bit less known is that there is an association in healthy individuals as well uh, between our baseline, for example, autonomic activity, especially baseline blood pressure and our pain threshold. Um, and this is something that has been kind of explored in, uh, in conditions such as hypertension and there are literally few studies looking into that in chronic pain. So I think I tackle into a mechanism that it's a little bit of a niche area that hasn't really been investigated and that has potential. Um, and um, what I mean is that um, the potential that these data have is that I think, I believe we're looking into a transdiagnostic mechanism as well. So it's something that can be then extended to uh, all the other chronic pain conditions, but not only, it's, it's basically, it would, uh, it, it would basically touch all the condition where there, there is a, a, a dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system and a, a change uh, in pain perception. Uh, such as, for example, I don't know, uh, Parkinson's, uh, pain in Parkinson is a big problem and obviously we know that there are uh, autonomic features as well, uh, Alzheimer's disease, but also psychiatric conditions such as um, anxiety, depression and so on and so on. Um, and another aspect that I think it's important is that uh, this project is starting as a mechanistic uh, investigation, but it does have a translational potential. So um, if we see that actually the stimulation of our receptors can trigger certain uh, profiles of the sending pain modulating uh, mechanisms, then we can actually then think of, of um, how can we use this knowledge to then uh, build some therapeutic, therapeutic intervention, either uh, with drugs or simply uh, with uh, neuromodulation. Um, and 
I think last point, which is uh, very important to me, is that as a clinical psychologist, is that I think it's a mechanism that links together uh, psychosocial and biomedical perspectives of chronic pain. We know that conditions such as worry, rumination, even pain catastrophizing uh, are uh, important factors in chronic pain. They're not only uh, um, a, a symbol of, uh, sorry, um, they're not only a reaction of living with chronic pain, but they, they're actually important predictors of transition. And from my previous research, uh, I see, I, I've investigated how these factors have an impact on the autonomic nervous system. So it's the idea of using the autonomic nervous system as a bridging gap between psychological states linked to chronic pain and biomedical theories of uh, pain sensitization, central pain networks, and the sending pain modulation. Okay, super. So. Just to put you on the spot, why do you think you won an EGG? So why do you think your project was selected for funding? Um, okay, so we haven't received any substantial form of feedback. So this is what I think. Um, I do believe it's, uh, <laughs> I try to be modest. Uh, I do believe it's, it's the <laughs> combination of many uh, winning factors. Um, I'm not doing very well in being modest, but uh, what I think is <laughs> First of all, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary project. So that's, in my opinion, it's important as it does give a higher chance of, um, of a, a breakthrough, it has a higher breakthrough potential into tackling uh, into more detailed mechanisms. Um, it is original. So I think when you look at, at my CV and where I was in my career at that point, it was clear that was the original output of my independent intellectual effort. So it was me coming from uh, an autonomic neuroscience research and then meeting the pain team for which I was working and just bringing my expertise and producing this original idea. And I think that's important. Um, as I said, it has translation potential and it is transact diagnostic, so it has actually a uh, very large translation potential. And um, it is indeed the first stepping stone towards bigger, more important grants. So from here, uh, depending on the results, of course, uh, we could think of going into clinical trials potentially further down the line, or what is my aim as well, into gathering more mechanistic insight by combining uh, MRI as well. So MRI, physiology, manipulation of the autonomic nervous system, I, I see there a lot of potential for basically giving me research ideas for the next 10 years. Um, yeah, I, I think these are, these are kind of the, the factors. Okay, so now I want to ask you a bit about COVID. So we know COVID-19 has had a big impact internationally on a lot of pain researchers. A lot of work has been interrupted. So could you speak a little bit to the situation in the UK? So how has research been impacted by COVID-19? Yeah, so unfortunately, I'm probably like uh, the type of research which has suffered the most. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to bring my experience. I think there are two, uh, two factors that uh, have had the, the strongest uh, impact. The first one obviously was the uncertainty and complete inability to plan anything, which is a little bit uh, the basics of when you're working on projects, of course. And uh, we were all a bit lost, like, what about our timelines? Um, and the second one is uh, the complete inability, the complete dis disruption of all of our activities. Um, this was true for all the types of research, but I believe it was a little bit more um, more disruptive. Obviously, in the case of uh, of research, which was uh, with uh, with participants in first place, so with humans, and in second place with with uh, clinical samples, so which are more vulnerable, vulnerable, which were just not uh, able to to come in and be tested anymore. Um, so what happened in UK and uh, in my institution, King's College, which is probably what what happened across the country, uh, is that any uh, data acquisition was completely stopped from March two thousand twenty. Uh, in my specific case, that meant that uh, that year when I was actually planning to, to gather my amazing pile of data, apply for big grants and all of that was actually completely put on hold, uh, which in a way, without sound, sounding too dramatic, but it has delayed 
uh, not of a year, but probably a bit more, my transition to A independence. Um, uh, the, the other thing that happened is that uh, because I was employed on grants, and again, the majority of uh, early career researchers are, and we couldn't collect data, this meant, this meant that we were uh, put on furlough. So we couldn't actually do any other research activities. Um, in the same way, the research assistant that was employed on my EGG grant was put on furlough from March 2020 till November 2020. So there was no data collection. We were just starting to, um, to uh, we finished our piloting phase and we started to think about recruiting participants just when that started. Um, so everything was disrupted, delayed, um, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I do believe that the type of research that we do had the strongest impact, of course. Uh, we were put in front of also an ethical dilemma in, in October when we, uh, we opened for a little while, for a month or two, is to, okay, we are kind of technically allowed, but I mean, the situation is still not safe. These are vulnerable people. Uh, yes, we can do whatever we can in the department, but they have to travel to the department. And this is for research, which is important, but it doesn't give an immediate benefit to the person, but in the same time, it puts them in danger. So what do we do? Uh, it, was, it was difficult, and it does, did mean that um, my EGG grant was completely disrupted during the last year. Uh, yeah. And Sorry, yeah, the last point is that uh, I'm also a parent of a little girl who was at home for most of 2020 and not going to school. So obviously that adds much more complexity and uh, yeah, that was yeah, great. That all sounds super stressful. I was just about to ask, what kind of support did you receive during this time, during the EGG when, you know, your work was quite interrupted? Yeah, so um, luckily, which was an enormous surprise, um, in that moment when everything started, I think the normal reaction in everyone is like, okay, let's let's start, let's try just to continue and produce as we used to. But uh, when I was in that mental state, actually, the reaction from my institution and later from uh, EGG was actually you know, it's it's not possible to do things as we used to. Even before I realized that that wasn't sustainable. Uh, from my institution, there was really um, um, an effort to put the scientists in first place and uh, the, the, our well-being, safety and mental well-being as well. Um, so that was really, really helpful um, on keeping everyone <laughs> sane. Um, from the EGG point of view, I did get in touch with um, EFIC and uh, Grunto and explain what the situation is. So I basically put down the fact that our institution closed. Uh, this was my timeline, this is what I did till March, these are my pilot data which were needed to before we started the, 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 the testing in participants and that was well accepted. I mean, um, I just couldn't deliver. The other points that was important in my case is that um, uh, the research assistant was put on furlough as well, and the furlough scheme covered 60% of the salary, which means that 40% had to come from the EGG grant. And it was, it's not nice to say it was wasted, but it was wasted in terms that we couldn't actually do anything for the grant, but luckily it was covering the person's salary, so it, was, uh, uh, it wasn't wasted. Um, but it wasn't going to, into the research. So I was left at the end of the year with no money in the pot, with no research assistant and no data. And um, I, I just simply explained the situation and explained with a clear timeline what happened, where the money went, what they did do. And that was well accepted. And um, uh, I think I'm uh, um, accepted to kind of top up a little bit and allow me to finish that project. So that was really helpful. Yeah, that's a bit of a relief. And where does your project stand currently? So what's the current situation? And when when do you think you'll expect initial results? Yeah, so we have just started. 
um, to test again in uh, at King's College at in my department at least. Um, so as I said, by March 2020, I have uh, we have actually built all our machine from scratch. So we built our our paradigm development team, not myself. Luckily, uh, have built the, the virus to stimulating device and we piloted that and we just made sure that we had strong bases. Okay, that the virus to stimulation produces the autonomic alteration. These are the pilot data. This is our CPM paradigm. Now we're ready to start. Um, so that part was done and it's nice and i also was able to uh to for example in a small group of, of participants i was able to explore whether the um bioreceptor sensitivity which is a measure of how our bioreflex responds to to uh to a change of um, of blood pressure whether the, this index is associated with cpm and i was able to find that association again which again gave me a bit more confidence into the into the science behind this project but the data acquisition was completely stopped which means that um a month ago I started, uh, when we were allowed to go into the department again, uh, I have employed a new research assistant and we are now uh, ready to start recruitment. Actually, we are starting this week and uh, my hope is to have pilot data by September. So probably not the full 30 and 30 participants, so 30 healthy controls and 30 uh, pain patients, but I'm aiming to, aiming to a solid 15 and 15 and just see what is in those data. Um, so that's that's the timeline at the moment. Great. Thanks, Elena. So I hope everybody listening found that really helpful. It was a good insight into the EGG experience and the research process. So overall, the EGG is a great opportunity for early career researchers and physicians to really push forward in their pain research career. As Elena said, it's a very simple, simple non-complicated process for applying, which is very unlike most research grants we apply for. It also has prestige attached to it, so you're not only getting funding for equipment and staffing, but also when you do get the results, there's a lot of emphasis placed on putting your results out there and giving them visibility. So that's very important in terms of your CV and communication, but also in terms of having an impact on care going forward. Also. As Elena explained, during COVID, the procedures were flexible there to support researchers. So if things go wrong, the, the grant experience and the procedures were able to cater to changes in the researchers' environment. And that's really, really important because, you know, internationally, some researchers just lost their jobs or, you know, there wasn't a flexible procedure in place to, to help people. Also, it's a great opportunity to collaborate and meet other early career researchers. And it's at that vital stage where an, er an early career researcher needs to go towards more research independence. And there's not a lot of grants in this space, in the pain research space, that, uh, that do that. So if you think you have a project that's very innovative, uh, innovative that could have an impact on patient care, um, it would be very good to, to put in an application. So I think that's the end of the interview, but now we're going on to questions and answers, if anybody has any questions for us. Hi, yes, this is uh, Melinda from the European Pain Federation, EPIC. So we've received a couple of questions, but I also want to just say this again, this is your chance to talk to a previous winner. So if there's anything you'd like to ask, or if you have any technical questions about the application process or anything you'd like to find out from us directly, this is your chance. So one question for Elena was, um, after having received the fund for your research project, how much time have you dedicated to reports to um, EFIC and can you maybe go into a bit more detail of what is requested, how do these reports look like? So um, unfortunately, I, I still haven't written a report because of COVID, um, and uh, we are we are required to write one at the end of the process, uh, but um, that hasn't been done yet in my case. Um, but I believe that uh, what what Ethic wants to see is that uh, the process of what has been done so from the beginning, how has actually that money been invest, invested, and what are if not the final data of the project, at least some pilot data and 
what is it looking like what is the direction that this project is taking so is it likely to 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 bring something important or is it actually something that needs a bit more thinking uh, so this is how i'm going to to tackle um, the report in a couple of months when i have a little bit more data thank you so much i guess since it's been um a very difficult and challenging 18 months. Um, you are kind of like, I don't want to say guinea pig, but yes, you kind of have to go through all the motions for us to figure out how to navigate research in, in, a, in a COVID and post-COVID world. Um, which would lead me to my next question, since COVID is still here in some form or another, um, will the next um, EGG be longer? Is the time frame going to be longer for the next project? A question for me? Well, it's basically for anyone who can um, who can uh, answer whether we um, whether it's possible. Um, actually, yes. Sorry, it's probably easiest for me to answer. So, with regards to um, the project timeframe for the uh, for the ongoing um, grant, we are collaborating closely, and we will of course adapt the process to the situation if requested, as we did with Elena last um, for the last time. So we absolutely work together in this case. Um, we have a question from someone who's asking um, whether it is possible to see a written example of a winning grant application. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, we do have um, Sophie here as well from Grunenthal. Is that something that we're able to do, Sophie? Uh, hi, Melinda, this is Sophie. Um, I, am, I am not sure, <laughs> very frankly, because of data protection. This is something that I guess I would have to to select one and to see with the with with the applicants if he's allowed to share his uh, personal data. So maybe um, I will come back uh, later with this uh, to this person who asked this question uh, with a, a live question. Oh, answer. Of sorry. <laughs> Perfect. And then we have a more general question: How much experience with pain patients is necessary before applying? Or maybe Elena, how much how much um, experience did you have with pain patients before you applied for the grant? So I kind of actually answer answer this question a little bit. Um, the thing is that I was really uh, pleasantly surprised is that. Uh, I was new to pain research, uh, so I had uh, experience with uh, on a psychologist by training. So obviously, depression, anxiety, which are all things that are important uh, in uh, in chronic pain, but not directly with chronic pain patients, not uh, even with pain research. So I had one or two publications on top of my other publications before, and I wasn't penalized. So it was really about the idea. It was a bit uh, really about, and this is what pain research is, right? It's multidisciplinary. So uh, we want just um, original ideas, which are the product of different fields uh, meeting together. Wonderful, thank you. We have another question from someone who um, is talking about you having employed a research assistant um, and they're wondering if that was part-time or full-time or how, how you planned that whole process and the cost of this post. So yeah, it was definitely part-time. Um, there wasn't enough funding uh, for a full-time researcher as there, um, I had to obviously plan for other expenses as well. So. Uh, participating participants, buying some pieces of equipment and so on. Uh, but even without those extra expenses, there wouldn't be enough money for, uh, which is which is what is uh, expected for this type of grants. So that's perfectly fine. Uh, in my case, it was only part time. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question is about the background. Um, so does the background of an early career scientist matter or is it just the proposed project that matters? So the, um, it depends what do you mean by background. Obviously, I think you have to demonstrate that methodologically you are able to deliver that project and to su supervise, in my in my case, the research assistant. So I think that, that was definitely my case as uh, the methodology was basically what I already uh, used before for example the barosapi simulation I applied this method in the application of emotions before pain um, so in that case I presume it has to be especially because it's a short 
grants, it's not a fellowship, so there isn't a strong training element or anything. So I think you have to demonstrate that you are on top of your methodology. Uh, in terms of um, area, as I said again, I was new to pain research. Uh, I wasn't coming from a completely different area. So again, the overlap between um, effective neuroscience and pain is just substantial uh, when we when we think about autonomic reaction and central mechanisms, we are basically uh, talking about overlapping areas and overlapping mechanisms. So that was, um, but again, I think that was the strength. So bringing a new perspective to, to chronic pain research. Um, it depends, depends how much the background is basically different from, from the project that you would like to, to apply for. Mary, would you like to add anything on this in general or? I, I think, yeah, I agree with Elena. I think you have to have a CV that shows you're capable of carrying out the project that you're, that you're applying with so that you have the skills. But in Elena's case, while she didn't have a large pain background, she had the skills from her previous work and the relationship there between the effective neuroscience and the emotional side to pain. But I think you need to demonstrate you have the skills and the leadership to lead this type of work. So you don't have to have an exact background in the exact project that you're going to apply with. If I can just briefly add, uh, I think what helped in my case is that before this small grant, I actually won a little smaller uh, award within King's, which then allowed me to, to gather small, tiny pilot data. So it's always obviously reassuring when you have some pilot data, even from your pre previous project, that show that there is actually something substantial in what you're saying. Uh, and that will probably increase the the likelihood, the validity of your project, the confidence that the founder has in your ideas. Okay, um, we have another question. I'm not sure if um, this is maybe for Sophie, um, but um, they're asking whether um, a, a, it's preferred to apply with a clinical or a preclinical pre research project for this grant. Um, hi. Um... I think this is something that I need to figure out with the with the, with the jury, and if you can, uh, I will go back to this uh, the, the person after the webinar. Yes, I will point out here that um, we uh, see a transcript of everyone's questions only for internal use, of course, and we can connect the person who has asked that question. So if we don't, if we're not unable to answer it now, we will do our best to follow up with you. Um, individually after this webinar. Okay, we have um, two more questions, just, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, for the application. So if someone has, is having technical problems with the application, um, of course, there are lots of contact emails. You can get in touch with EGG administration on the website on egg.info, or of course, you can always just reach out to someone at EFIC and ask for help and help will be given. Um, now for the timeline for this project, how long will it take until the winners are announced? So the application, um, that is important for anyone who's interested, the deadline for application is on the 30th of September of this year. So you have a few more months during the summer to get your ducks in a row and then the announcement, it will take roughly two and a half months to work through all the projects. And we are planning on announcing the winners um, in the middle of December 2021. So definitely this year. And I see we have another question here coming in. Oh, sorry. Um, there is just someone else who is interested in the question regarding clinical or pre-clinical pre projects. So we will get back to you as well. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, I would like to ask Elena and Mary for any closing words. I don't have any particular closing words to you, Elena, at this point. No, no, I would just like to thank um, Efik and Grenatal again for uh, allowing me to be part um, and allow me to win this grant, which is it's, it's a great scheme. So I definitely encourage uh, all the early career researchers to in the field of uh, pain research to apply for this grant, which is um, which is it, it's very prestigious in the field and it definitely gives you lots of visibility. So yeah, go for it. 
Yeah, and I, I would just like to thank all the people for attending this webinar and just repeat Melinda's words again. If, you've, if you're interested in applying or if you want more information, please visit the EGG website, the Epic Run and Tell Grant website, e-g-g.info. You have, as, as we mentioned several times, the application is really simple and not complicated. So you have about three and a half months until the 30th of September 2021 to get, into your, get in your application. And also the EGG have a LinkedIn group. So if you want to stay updated on all activities, go ahead and join the LinkedIn group. And I just want to wish the best of luck to anyone that's applying on this call. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.